and welcome to International Voices, the July edition. I am your host and moderator, Udo Fluk, and I have the good fortune to oversee the Office of Global and Cultural Affairs in Arts Missoula. International Voices podcasts offer a unique insight into the diverse services the Office of Global and Cultural Affairs provides. If you have not had a chance yet, please consider listening to my radio recordings from earlier this year, featuring Arts Missoula Executive Director Tom Benson, Mayor John Engen, and Dr. Sarge Patel, a British neuroscience researcher. International Voices is a monthly podcast brought to you by Global and Cultural Affairs of Arts Missoula and The Trail 1033. The May and June podcasts focused on the global and cultural affairs, intercultural and global education outreach program offered in Missoula's K through 12 and an education panel of experts composed of 10 teachers and one principal from elementary, middle and high schools in Missoula, talking about the importance of global and intercultural perspectives and skill building. Through my position, I have the privilege of overseeing the strategic sister city relations for the city of Missoula as well. This, the July episode, focuses on sister cities, the COVID-19 impact on community, economy, and education, as well as embracing biculturalism in indigenous and non-indigenous communities. My guest today is from a place halfway around the world, New Zealand, to be precise. It is my great pleasure to welcome Mrs. Tony Grace, the International Relations Manager in Palmerston North, one of the two sister cities Missoula has, and the oldest official connection our city has to an international community. This relationship started almost 40 years ago, and one reason why this people-to-people diplomacy program is stronger than ever today is because of Tony. Tony, please tell us about your role in the Palmerston North city government. Well, kia ora, Udo. Um, it's nice to be here. And uh, yeah, my role is the international relations manager for the Palmerston North City Council, which is a reasonably um, new role for the for the city council here. But I've been in the role for about four, coming up four years now. And really the purpose of the role is to help support the city's important international connections in a range of ways. So part of that's with our sister city relationships, with Missoula being the longest standing of those, coming up 40 years soon. And, uh, you know, other uh, things we do with the city, supporting the mayor with engagement with the diplomatic corps, you know, ambassadors and high commissioners, and other important international visitors that might be coming to our city. Great. Speaking of sister cities and sister city connections, why have sister city connections been beneficial for the participants and why might they be of even greater importance during a pandemic? Yeah, well, it's a good question. And if you think about the origin of the Sister Cities movement, it really came in uh, post-World War II when, uh, you know, the world was, had been quite divided. You know, humanity was kind of in a a sense of shock of of how such a a atrocity could could come about. Sister Cities were seen as a great way to um, connect people to people around the world. Um, You know, geopolitics will do what geopolitics will do, but sometimes the, the best way to ensure peace and, and understanding between countries and cultures is actually just to connect uh, real life people, whether that's, you know, professionals or doctors, academics, uh, community members. So, you know, while it has post-war origins uh, around uniting the world um, in very testing uh, times, sister cities have, have evolved over the years to become more um, kind of multifaceted uh, cultural, social, economic connections that have a range of, of different benefits for different areas of the community. But of course, where we are during COVID, you know, we're back in a global crisis again. And you can see as well that the, the global politics around that rears its head and the ability to, to have and maintain these strong community to community connections as important today as, as they have ever been. Well, and I would agree um, with what you said about 
the importance of it because I don't think that there has ever been a time where it's really not important to have a connection to the world and to have a, uh, a connection to another city and its people. But you're right, during a global crisis, one could argue that it's even more important to be connected to others, especially when we think about how we manage through these crises. And so the Sister City program, from what I have learned um, overseeing the program in Missoula, is that you can learn a lot from what others are going through. And you can learn a lot from, well, probably even mistakes that others might have done. And they would say, hey, you know, we've done this. Don't try this again because that's not going to work. Uh, it might be helpful for a twin city to to hear about these things so that they can adjust their own strategy or or, you know, their own way of going about things. That was, I think, the idea behind this to me anyway, this idea of, uh, you know, could this be more important uh, in a time of crisis yeah. where we can learn from each other? And and I think that's certainly the, um, especially modern day sister cities, this is one of the most valuable things you can get out of them is that ability to connect and share knowledge, share ideas, share best practice. And uh, for example, the uh, mayors of, of Palmerston North and Missoula had a a Zoom call, not unlike we are doing now, Udo, the other day, um, and uh, talked about their respective COVID-19 situations, response and recovery plans. Uh, we shared Palmerston North's um, city recovery plan and, and it's, it's really, um, you know, people might say, well, why, why not just do that with cities in your own country? But I think there is definitely a value in, in being able to get ideas and inspiration from a place that's a little more removed from, from where you are. Sometimes you can just get stuck in the same old ideas, uh, but the ability to have a, a partner on the other side of the world who might come up with a solution or have tried an approach to a problem that wouldn't even have occurred in, in your own country or your own region uh, is incredibly valuable. And it's even better uh, when you have several sister city connections because then you get feedback and opinions and experiences from different perspectives and you can you can sort of weigh them and you can get perhaps some kind of a uh, of a medium out of all of them um, which brings me to my next question that palmerston north is twinned internationally with cities in japan and in china how have your partner communities been impacted by the COVID pandemic? Uh, yes, uh, so our, our partner cities in China and Japan have also, like, like most countries and most cities around the world, been impacted by this pandemic. The earliest, of course, being our sister cities in, in China who were in a full lockdown back in uh, February. As a show of solidarity and support then, um, we, we had our Festival of Cultures in Palmerston North and uh, did a lantern parade kind of a, and, and uh, had some lanterns there with messages of support for our Chinese sister cities. Of course, at the time, not everybody around the world anticipated that this would become a global pandemic, but um, we, we showed that level of support then, um, particularly when it was impacting our, our Chinese partners very hard. Uh, and in return, one of our, our sister cities, Guiyang in China, uh, sent our city 10,000 face masks to support our own COVID-19 response when we just a couple of months later were in full lockdown uh, which was very gratefully received and, and really helped out a number of our uh, community uh, uh, and response volunteers. What's interesting with the pandemic I find when I observe the European news media is that it's almost they have gone through certain stages already within a couple of weeks we are going through. So it's it's almost like it's like a forecast of what, what is likely to happen on your own turf um, because of how it's spread and that, you know, it's spread from Asia to Europe and then from Europe to the United States. So that's what sort of the the flow of it. And I think while it was perhaps slower and faster in some regions of the world, it seems like some hotspots that used to be in Europe are not hotspots anymore. They're actually over it. They flattened the curve and they have figured out after coming out of 
lockdown and going into the next phases, how to manage this. And so I think that can also be um, helpful and, and perhaps even educational for one's own strategy to sort of look at how, uh, you know, what have others done that are a little bit ahead of the game and, and what can we learn from this? And I would certainly think with your sister city in China that they have gone through some of the things uh, almost first before many other places in the, in the world did. That can certainly be an advantage in trying mm. to adjust one's strategy. So that's, that's really- And good. we did have um, our partner cities in China were, were very um, willing to, sh to share their experience and um, best practice and what they had learned in, in recovering uh, from the virus. So uh, it, that was certainly appreciated. Uh, but of course, every, every country is different and every right. country has a new situation. And this, uh, those differences can be great for exchanging best practice and knowledge, you know, not just talking about the pandemic here, but in general, when you're sharing um, knowledge, sure. because it can give you new ideas, new inspiration, a different perspective. Equally, though, you've got to take that in, in the context of the country that you're in. So there are some a huge New Zealand is small, you know. Countries like America and China are huge. So um, it's different challenges for different countries, but there's sure. certainly things we can learn from each other. Right. And I think equally as well, it's that ability to um, have those community and cultural connections at a time when global politics can be quite fraught. So I think that underlying cultural connection is something I think we take for granted uh, a lot during peacetime and during times of reasonable stability. And uh, during times of crisis, it's easy for things like cultural difference to be to be uh, exacerbated or, or used um, to divide. And so having that strength and unity and cultural understanding and connection certainly helps to ride through those periods, which are um, have a bit more tension. If you will. Absolutely. Now, with in-person, international, uh, educational and cultural exchanges on hold, in the interest to reduce the spread of COVID-19, what other ways do you see for sister cities to benefit its citizens? Yeah, so with our own program here in Palmerston North, we are um, looking, you know, we're demonstrating it right now, Udo. I think we've all become a lot more adept at Zooming and uh, video conferencing and uh, looking to digital means of cooperation. So, um, if anything, I think, you know, this is a great opportunity for sister cities to look to expand those capabilities in those, those digital channels. Um, the added benefit being there too, that they are more inclusive. You know, it, is, it does take a lot and it is expensive for somebody to get on a plane and go somewhere and meet face to face, as valuable as that is. Uh, so I really look forward to being able to take advantage of this opportunity to really dive deep on the, on the digital programs with our sister cities look at ways we can connect um, different um, government departments, uh, businesses and agencies, uh, schools, classrooms. Uh, I think there's, um, we're certainly, certainly not sitting on our hands and, and just kind of waiting it out. There's plenty to do. Uh, and the other thing our International Relations Office too is um, uh, reorienting towards our engagement with the diplomatic corps here in New Zealand. So. Here in Palmerston North, we're lucky. We're only a couple of hours away from Wellington, our capital city, and uh, all the um, embassies and high commissions that are based there. Uh, and so uh, uh, while we can't necessarily go overseas and engage with countries or have international visitors, there are still international representatives in our own communities um, and in our country that we can still um, advance our relationships with. And you're absolutely right. Uh, this time of crisis has also shown uh, great uh, innovation and, um, and great uh, improvements in some areas where people probably would have never looked to improve anything because they were fine with the way things were. But the silver lining is almost that there was a catalyst to, to do things differently and, uh, and to, um, to perhaps modify even sister city programming. And, and who knows uh, when we will have real exchanges again, especially for, uh, for uh, high school students and university students in that regard. But I think you're right, there's, uh, there's lots uh, that actually can be done even without physically 
visiting um, and, and lots that can be learned uh, language wise, culture wise. Um, so there's, uh, it's, it's almost like there's a plan B um, for sister city relations that, that we have now entered. And probably we would have not if, yeah, um, you know, if there would have not been the need, so. The, the best innovations come from times of constraint. You know, right. you have con constraints, whether it's on your resources or you, your ability to, to do things the way you used to. Right. And, you know, we're in, in some of the Skypes we've had with sister cities, we're talking about setting up potentially um, youth leadership summits where young people can come together and talk about common interests in environmental sustainability, um, whether it's an applied issue like uh, waste management or river revitalization, so uh, or other topics that might be um, important to to the young people um, of today. Right, I, I found that, and I've heard this from several colleagues that uh, working on uh, a digital platform, it's almost like you are more focused because you are less less distracted. Um, that many people have said, you know, if in a traditional environment or in a traditional way of doing things, there are many distractions. But when you actually are very focused on something and you need to get it done, uh, such as a Zoom meeting, you're, you know, you, you're, you don't allow to be distracted uh, where you might normally have that. So it's almost perhaps a case could be made that it might be more efficient in the end and it might be more focused because there are less things that people might normally do um, that they're now in a digital platform or in a digital way are not doing. They're just focusing on that individual um, virtual meeting or on getting that individual task done. So probably there's, there's that too. But yeah. Um, now, Tony, while we are about 7,400 miles apart, or to speak more in uh, your and my way of counting this, about 12,000 kilometers apart, you are no stranger to Missoula. Please tell us about being the first participant in the Culture and Language Immersion Program, or short CLIP, that is offered as part of our sister city programming. Yes, Udo, so I've been to Missoula twice now in fact the first time was in 2018 with our uh, mayoral delegation uh, which included representatives from you know the city council my, myself and the mayor and uh, mayor is michelle smith and um, uh, massey university representatives and uh, wudamu and tres tiawiawi um, komatoa of rangitani iwi uh, the Māori tribe and indigenous to our region and representing our region. So um, that was a great visit. And uh, that was my first experience of Missoula, uh, which I thoroughly enjoyed. Uh, you put the program together for us, Udo. It was, it was <laughs> full on and relentless, oh, just but it was very enjoyable. And um, enough so that when um, you told me about the, the CLIP program and uh, invited um, me to take the opportunity to, to be the inaugural um, member of this uh, cultural leadership and um, immersion program, um, I was more than happy to do so. And that really gave me the opportunity to return to Missoula um, about uh, you know 18 months uh, later and uh, really immerse myself in, in the city for a, a good while. Because uh, while that first visit was great to scratch the surface and, and get to know Missoula briefly, there's only so much you can learn when you're in a place for less than a week. Um, and it feels very rushed and you feel like you're just on the cusp of learning something exciting and then you're whisked away to the next thing. And, um, you know, the, the thing that stood out for me in my visit to Missoula is how much like Palmerston North it is. Um, you know, we're both cities of around kind of uh, Missoula's about 75 to 80,000 and Palmerston North's about 90, 90 odd thousand people. So it's Population wise, we're the same, but also we're university cities uh, with rivers running through the middle, and we have a lot of shared interests, values. Uh, people really value the, the great outdoors. And uh, because of that, um, there are so many parallels. And coming back to the point about the opportunity to learn from each other, um, especially being similar cities but in different places, 
uh, I really wanted to use that uh, two month clip program to uh, fully immerse myself in the city and meet a range of different um, partners and stakeholders from business, government, uh, community representatives, university. Um, the University of Montana was kind enough to host me through the Global Engagement Office on a um, J1 visa, which also meant that my family was able to join. Um, and that, that, was, um, that was good, especially it being a whole um, two month visit. But the uh, visit itself was incredibly um, valuable for what we could get out of it. The intention I went in into the program with was, uh, you know, I really wanted to come away with a sense of, you know, what, if, we, if we were to narrow down what our cities can do together to a few top priorities, what would those areas be? Um, what's the, the best kind of steps? What are may, we maybe looking towards in kind of two, three, four years time? Uh, and uh, across the range of, of uh, meetings that I was able to have with university and business and government, um, a number of great projects have, have kind of gotten off the ground. So with um, University of Montana and MS University, um, which was of course the origin of the sister city relationship, that campus to campus, uh, connection, um, they're really now looking into um, ways they can collaborate together uh, more strategically around common programs of interest, environmental studies, indigenous studies, uh, as well as the um, one of the great connections um, I was able to make while over there was between the Massey Student Enterprise Hub here in Palmerston North and the um, Blackstone Launchpad and Innovation Factory at University of Montana. So both universities around about the same time um, had the same idea to, to, you know, open and extend their student enterprise uh, hub. So I was able to act as a bit of a conduit between the cities. And, and wherever I saw there was something interesting that I thought somebody back home might want to connect on, I kind of played that matchmaker, got the people together, did a Zoom like this with the people on the ground in Missoula and the people back home. And uh, a number of initiatives around education, um, uh, environmental sustainability, uh, you know, business and uh, government, city to city, council cooperation, um, all emerged from this visit. So it was a really, um, really valuable time for strengthening the partnership. Wonderful. Now you talked about uh, what you gained professionally, but, um, and, but you also mentioned that, and I know that your family came along. So how did it impact you on a more personal level and your family away from the, the strict sort of professional benefit. Yeah, and yeah, it was great to, to have my family with me and yourself, Udo and Nancy were very kind um, hosts to us, making sure we could all experience uh, family life in Missoula um, as kind of authentically as possible. And uh, I really enjoyed that because working in international relations, you know, I do have to travel reasonably frequently overseas, but uh, often alone in a work capacity, and that is very tough when you have a family with children. So um, uh, on a personal level, it was great. Um, the, our two kids uh, were able to go to school in Missoula School and Daycare, so they really enjoyed that opportunity to experience uh, school life um, in another country, in another city, and I'm sure that's something that's gonna stay with them for a long time. Uh, and likewise, uh, my husband was able to um, uh, make a lot of great connections in Missoula. He, he works um, uh, with, in a brewery in Palmerston North. He co-owns a brewery, so had a, he had a great time connecting with um, uh, some of the many <laughs> microbreweries in Missoula and uh, making great connections, uh, tasting a few uh, delicious Missoula brews and uh, even a collaboration with uh, Draft works. So he, you know, at a personal level and family level, you know, that my uh, family had a great time as well and got a lot of value from the visit. Wonderful. What, uh, uh, what stood out for you most uh, in sort of the similarities and differences that you saw between uh, Palmerston North or New Zealand as a country and uh, Missoula and Montana or the United States because I know that you also had a chance to travel a little bit while you were here so it's not that you just saw Missoula and experienced uh, Missoula and its people but also 
um, uh, in other places around the country. So what, mm. what were some of the things that, because people always think that we're so different, right? And especially when you look at places that are halfway around the world, but is it really that different or are there more similarities than differences? Uh, I mean, there are always similarities and differences, but, you know, one of the things I love about Missoula and I love about our sister city connection is that, um, you know, culturally we, we, we're quite similar um, in our approach. Uh, the thing I, I've really noticed about Montana and New Zealand, not just the natural beauty. So we had uh, the pleasure of being able to visit uh, on, the, on the weekends um, places like Yellowstone uh, National Park and Glacier Park and a lot of that, you know, looked a lot like places in New Zealand, but equally, um, you know, the friendliness, the relaxed nature, particularly um, the informality um, of Montanans, I think is very similar to Kiwis. You know, we, we're a um, reasonably informal um, bunch. Um, uh, I think I remember we, we met the governor and uh, we'd all kind of suited up thinking, oh, you know, an American um, uh, you know, state uh, representatives, I guess, would be formal. And I, I think he was wearing jeans. <laughs> it was, we, we felt like very much at home because New Zealand's a very kind of jeans and, and uh, you know, casual wear type of place as well. So that, that sense of um, formality, uh, informality, um, uh, friendliness. Um, uh, but equally, I think the sense of community that's in Missoula particularly um, resonates a lot with uh, Palmerston North. I think part of it comes with being a mid-sized city. You know, you're big enough to have really kind of exciting um, events and activities um, going on, um, but small enough that a lot of people know each other. Um, there's a, a lot of goodwill and uh, reciprocity between people and, you know, with our joint love of the, the great outdoors, um, I think there are just so many things um, in common between the people of Missoula and Palmerston North. And you mentioned earlier when we started out this podcast that uh, our sister city relationship is going on 40 years. So mm. this is also, I think, uh, proof that over four decades, there was lots of connections in many different ways and lots of similarities uh, that brought people together. And I think it all started just for our listeners. I mean, you and I know this, but um, just for our listeners, it all started with a um, University of Montana professor, Harold Bockermuhl, who uh, studied at Massey University and um, was doing research, I believe. And so um, when he came back to Missoula, he talked about his ex his experience in uh, in at Massey University and in Palmerston North. And so I think he was really sort of the founding father of this uh, sister city relationship that is now going on four decades. Uh, and many student exchanges have happened, of course, between the University of Montana and Massey University, many faculty exchanges and um, research uh, projects and things of that nature. But I also think there's lots of private connections that people mm. have. And, and every so often, you know, you uh, talk to somebody in town and uh, uh, somebody that you think you actually know a little bit and um, Palmerston North comes up and the person might just say, oh yeah, I've been to Palmerston North. It was in the late 70s or in the early 80s, but um, I've been there. And, uh, you know, what a great sister city connection. And you think, wow. There's a, you know, this goes back a couple decades, but um, mm. people, people have experienced that sister city connection in some shape or form. So, and I think that's a sign of a of a good strong sister city relationship is when it's it's more than just the officials. It's more than right. just um, the 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 city councils or the yeah. governments or the mayors coming together, but it is actually just it is which is the original intention, right. this, the people-to-people -people connection. And over the years between Missoula and Palmerston North, there have been um, choirs that have gone back and forth. Um, right. I think at one point, there was some, a quilting group and um, uh, people um, on a motorcycle tours for tourism reasons. A rugby team, the Missoula Maggots, have been to Palmerston North. Right. And, uh, you know, with all these um, great community connections, whether it's arts, uh, sports, uh, right. cultural community, 
um, you know, these make up the fabric of, of the sister city relationship. And you're right, the more diverse it is, the stronger the fabric is. If it's just one connection that may be uh, on a city government level, um, you know, when that mayor is not mayor anymore, that may also then end the, the sister city connection. And, and we know that this has happened in the past because these mm. sister city relations go through cycles. And they're, depending on who is, who is uh, uh, you know, guiding the whole, uh, the whole city, if that person is interested in international relations, uh, it may sort of uh, spike a little bit. And then when mm. you have uh, city leadership that isn't all that interested, oftentimes these programs can be dormant for several years until there is a spike again. So it's very much driven by people. And you're right. The more connections there are uh, in not just sort of the government area, but also in the arts, uh, in you know, business, uh, trade, there is certainly reason to believe that those programs are stronger and last longer than if there's just sort of, you know, one, one official connection kind of a thing. So that's, that's really nice to hear you say that, that mm. over the years there have been this diverse sort of involvement of people uh, that made the program even stronger. Um, while in the United States, experts agree we are in the middle of a pandemic with the virus spreading in many communities and it is challenging for many people to clearly envision a post-pandemic life, New Zealand is officially in its post-pandemic phase with no new community transmission in several weeks. What are some experiences you can share having gone through the cycle that would help Missoula envision a post-pandemic life? Hmm. And, uh, you know, I don't think anyone's out of the woods yet with this um, pandemic. Uh, in New Zealand, we are, you know, our, our distance um, is, is often a disadvantage to New Zealand, but in some circumstances, it can be an advantage. And that, that has certainly been the case I would with agree. this um, pandemic. Um, you know, and one of the challenges we're now facing is while, while we've managed to um, eliminate community transmission in New Zealand, and we had a couple of weeks there with no... Uh, official um, recorded cases of COVID anywhere in the country. Um, the other new, unique thing about New Zealand is that so many, um, uh, so much of our population lives abroad. It's like a good fifth of our, our population lives overseas. And I think a lot of people are, are looking to return home in these uncertain times. Sure. Uh, so that has been the big challenge for, for our country is, is managing the arrivals at the border and ensuring that there is a managed quarantine and testing process to ensure that doesn't then go on to community um, transmission. Um, so, but what that has allowed us to do here back in New Zealand at a community level is, is kind of return to uh, things, you know, I say normal in, in, in quote marks, um, because uh, things are certainly still different. I think uh, all around the world, the uh, lockdowns and the uh, you know, the, the response we've all had to go to to this pandemic has really made all of us sit back and, and think about what's what's important. Think about um, the way we go about things. So we're now in New Zealand at what's called Alert Level 1, um, which is uh, very similar to um, uh, you know, pre-COVID times. Uh, we can um, move freely about. Uh, events are back on. Um, there was a, a rugby game on uh, at one of our big stadiums recently, and that was a, that was a big deal for a lot of people who um, hadn't been out to see a rugby match in a while. Um, so yeah, while while we're seeing public events start back up and things, there are still some, you know, residual um, kind of cautions and feelings of you know, what do we want this new normal to look like? So we're all shaking hands again and able to hug which is great I'm a hugger so I really missed being able to do that over the over the lockdown and and in the um, uh, social distancing time uh, but I think for a lot of people that time particularly in the the level four of the lockdown which is what we called it in New Zealand which was a full you know everybody stay at home please you know you're allowed out to exercise but try not to go beyond your neighborhood all that type of thing 
um, suddenly there were no cars on the road and people could the, the could hear the bird song in full force and uh, got to spend more time with their families. Um, um, like many families in Missoula are experiencing, that comes with its challenges when you're especially trying to work through. Um, but, uh, you know, people had a lot of time to reflect on the daily rush of things. You know, I think in our society, there is this kind of culture of cramming as much in as you can and, you know, you, the, the rushing from, from school drop to work to, uh, you know, all the different uh, commitments. Um, I think it's given, you know, one of the silver linings of it all has been that opportunity for people to reflect on you. What do we want to, to do? What do we want um, our future to look like? And what have we learned about the way we, we want our world to be? Um, so I'm, I'm certainly hoping that post-COVID we'll be able to look at whether it's our economies, um, our uh, lifestyles, you know, all these different elements. Um, just the other day, uh, we had a session um, within our, our unit at council with my colleagues kind of coming back together post COVID to reflect on, on some of these things, and, but also look at, um, you know, the, the 2030 United Nations Sustainable Development Goals and say, you know, we were also at a point where, you know, a lot of people have said, you know, let's not worry about all that because of COVID, but if anything, you know, this is, there, there are great challenges ahead, you know, even when we get past this pandemic around, climate change and around um, sustainability, whether that's uh, social, uh, cultural, environmental or economic. Um, and so our city's post-COVID recovery plan takes all of those elements into account. And so, our, um, you know, we're, we're all trying to reflect on, you know, how do we use this as a catalyst opportunity to you know, in the same way you mentioned before that the pandemic has kind of accelerated some things that were already happening, all of a sudden we have to adapt to new digital ways of communicating. Um, you know, how do we use this to accelerate some of the positive, constructive changes around sustainability um, in our own communities and resilience too? I think it's, it's you know, we've put a lot of assumptions around things maybe we invest our economy in and, and we need to think about how we ensure that any future events we have economic, social, cultural, environmental resilience to any, any uh, future events or shocks. Yeah, I, I would agree that it, it, makes you, it makes you think about what you can improve and how mm. you can change some things that probably normally you would have never changed because there was no reason to reflect on it. But, and I think we're doing that here too. We're trying to figure out, uh, you know, many things ranging from, like you said, from uh, the economy. Um, you said earlier, uh, you know, certain professions have always traveled a lot. And while one might say that there is nothing better than personal interaction with somebody. It's costly and mm. it's, uh, it's an impact on the environment. And, uh, you know, there's all kinds of, of uh, perhaps negative parts that one could also point out that if people do that in a Zoom meeting, uh, you know, it's uh, resource friendly, it's environmentally friendly, uh, it's, uh, it's actually friendly in many other ways too. So um, probably what might happen, I'm thinking, might be that there might be less business traveling going on. And people might mm. say, well, yeah, you know, uh, normally I would have gone and it would have cost me a couple thousand dollars to fly there and to stay and, to, you know, cost of lodging and whatnot. But um, we could actually do the same meeting uh, on Zoom and it may just be as effective. So some things that people might rethink. And clearly this is not, uh, you know, possible uh, to do in every area or or to an absolute because there will always be um, you know a reason for traveling and for people to interact face to face mm. but probably some of it could be modified and, mm. and I think and even locally I think a lot of people you know during the lockdown use their cars less you know Absolutely. and they just found they had all these cars in their driveways and said well actually we 
we had to walk everywhere and actually it was quite pleasant or <laughs> you know right. do we need all these things uh, I think for a lot of at the height of the lockdown in New Zealand people um, weren't able to go and do a lot of shopping that they ordinarily would have done um, online or um, right. uh, and it, it, it even got to an extent in New Zealand where only essential items could be shipped out so right. Uh, while that, you know, did have an impact on the economy, I think it made people reconsider as well, what things am I buying that I actually don't need? Do they bring value to my life? Um, I've had to go a whole month without any online or, or, or in-person shopping sprees. And am I actually, but I'm doing fine. You know, so right. I think it's it has really at a, you know, personal and professional level made people think about, you know, is there a different way? You know, right. um, can right. I can I get bring the best of, of both worlds um, to live more sustainably, to live more intentionally, um, and uh, you know I think there are certainly advantages. I'd love to see um, Missoula expand um, these digital connections. I think you can get a much broader range of people coming together if if the cost element is 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 reduced. Um, I'd love to hear from any schools or classrooms that want to do a, a Zoom or a Skype connection with, with schools or classrooms here in, in Palmerston North. And, um, you know, also good for us to be able to talk to other people on the other side of the world who've been through the same process and share right. stories and experiences. Right. Well, and especially I think the, uh, the field of education um, holds great promise to to really reevaluate some things and and look at instruction and how instruction can probably be more effective and efficient and at a broader range um, where you know if you are confined to a classroom that only holds fifteen or twenty students, then that 's your capacity that 's all you mm -hmm. can do where if you open it up uh, and more people can join, you have uh, you know more diversity in the classroom, probably richer discussions. I mean, all kinds of things um, that I think are currently exactly the things that our school district is uh, is evaluating and looking at how how will the fall uh, unfold for K through 12 and for the university for that matter, uh, but also for K through 12 because, um, you know, so many things had to change. And I don't know how it was in Palmerston North, but here um, kids stopped going to uh, the classrooms um, uh, basically in mid-March. Uh, th there was spring break, and then after spring break, uh, they didn't go back, and they didn't go back till the end of the school year. So they never even saw their own classroom again, and it was all done online. And it was remarkable that within one week, basically, a lot of teachers um, do not have an online curriculum. And so they had to, to convert material and they had to function digitally. And, and I'm thinking that that is a, a great accomplishment um, for anybody that has ever taught anything and has traditional notes uh, to, to sort of move everything to a digital platform is uh, within a week is actually mm. quite amazing but it worked yeah, out well take my hat off to to all the essential workers who who worked through yes uh, have and are still continuing to work through and adapt um to the new circumstances and you know whether it's uh, medical professionals teachers emergency services uh, supermarket workers you know uh, it's been um, incredible and and i think again coming back to that reflection piece, it really makes you reflect on a society about the different, how we kind of take some services or people for granted. And But when, you know, you come to a situation like this, you know, the people who keep our communities running, you know, it, it's, it really gives you a whole other level of appreciation. Right. Now, you were just talking about uh, what we can learn and what our individual uh, sister cities, Palmerston North and Missoula, might have learned for future global health challenges. What, what are some of the things that you, and I know you are also a member of the city council in Palmerston North, what have you and your colleagues talked about as far as, uh, you know, if, if this should happen again or something similar, hopefully not, but if it would, what would we do differently and how are we better prepared in the future? 
And uh, yeah, one of the um, interesting experiences working for the city council was that soon after uh, the emergency, uh, the state of emergency was declared in New Zealand, as we had to activate what's called our emergency operations centre. And uh, my role was redeployed into that emergency operations centre, or we call it the EOC, um, to help with um, the planning function of that. And boy, that was a that was a that was an experience because I haven't had a lot of experience in emergency management, and uh, uh, it was all quite sudden, um, but a really um, great learning opportunity uh, around. Uh, the different emergency management functions, about being prepared, um, about parallel event planning. Uh, I think for New Zealand, uh, we are always, uh, I think much like Montana as well, conscious of some of these um, other emergency risks, which are maybe more front of mind. So earthquakes, um, flooding, you know, these are, these are both right. um, emergencies that both of our cities and regions are, are quite familiar with. And I think uh, come first and foremost when we're thinking about emergency management and preparedness. Right. Um, I think pandemics have always been on that list, um, but we probably ha they haven't been as front of mind. And this really Thankfully. brought home, <laughs> I think, yeah, for 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 um, our emergency planning um, that scenario. And of course, it was very different because in, in other emergency scenarios and. Uh, you know, we have had communications between our cities on interest in exchanging information about emergency management. Uh, in fact, there is a Missoulian that lives in, in Palmerston North who works in our regional emergency management office. Um, but, uh, you know, I think this for us got us thinking about, you know, how do we prepare uh, in, in the earthquake and flood scenarios? It's very much more infrastructure you know, damage to buildings, you know, we're thinking more in that, you know, kind of uh, physical infrastructure damage. And, and what the pandemic really made us think about, there wasn't really any physical damage. This wasn't a flood, this wasn't an earthquake, nothing fell down or broke apart physically. Um, what it really tested was our, our community welfare response. So uh, being able to ensure during the lockdown that when people couldn't leave their homes, particularly the, the elderly or people with who, who are immunocompromised, um, were able to get all the food, um, you know, blankets, medicine, everything that they needed. So this was a big part of the response. Um, but, you know, also the economic, social and, and cultural welfare of the, of the city and that uh, resilience um, is, is something certainly that we're going to be, you know, taking forward into the future um, to think about these emergencies in, in a more holistic way. Um, and that's certainly been, a, there'll be a lot of debrief we'll be doing over the coming months um, about, you know, how it all went, what we learned, what we can do better next time. Uh, but yeah, it's just, it was a, a very different kind of natured emergency to ones that I think we're, we're usually um, prepped and, and ready for. Oh, oh, absolutely, and and I I would agree with you. Um, we don't have uh, a lot of earthquakes here because of uh, the geological uh, structure. I mean, they, they increase once you move towards Yellowstone, yeah, uh, but correct. but but over here, you know, there isn't much. And and if there are any, uh, you only learn uh, of it through the media. And uh, you go, really, there was an earthquake last night? I didn't even know. Now, in New Zealand, that's a little different because of the unique um, geological uh, location and the fact that you um, have had these in the past. So probably there's a much greater sort of awareness and um, a much greater uh, public response to these things. Mm. Um, similar to... You know, every spring we have flooding in Missoula. It's because the snow melts in the mountains, and then all the water goes into the uh, into the rivers and in the Clark Fork River, and then the rivers rise. And you know, I mean, it's every year the same thing. And so mm. people, it's like, oh yeah, there's going to be an area where the water levels are going to rise again. It's every year the same thing. Um, if we have some time, uh, let's go and fill some sandbags and you know help. Uh, help with the community work that that is sort of required in these difficult times uh, and i think people are used to it but you're right 
the last pandemic is a hundred years ago. And so, um, you know, there wasn't much knowledge about how people did things a hundred years ago. And so uh, there wasn't much to go by. And it was all sort of a learning learning as we were doing it or as we were going along. But, but again, um, I think this emergency management is, a, is another great example of an area where sister cities can really learn from each absolutely. other. Absolutely. Um, just uh, absolutely. a couple of years ago, we had uh, our Japanese sister cities, so Japan being another country which has a similar risk profile to New Zealand in terms of natural disasters. Yes. Uh, so uh, we've had an exchange of emergency management uh, personnel between our city councils to share that knowledge and best practice around how we are prepared for these emergencies and how we deal with them. So uh, that's, I think post COVID is going to be another great opportunity to share what we've learned and, and how we can be better prepared and, and share new ideas. Right. Now in, in all of this, of course, uh, over here, uh, not that uh, a pandemic wasn't enough uh, to struggle with, um, there was also, in addition, the the racial justice issues that have come up, um, and not that they weren't there before, but they they sort of moved uh, front and center um, in the last, uh, in basically in the last month, um, and and I also know, um, knowing a little bit about New Zealand and a little bit about again our shared. Uh, sort of um, uh, our shared values and our shared uh, culture and our um, shared traditions and shared customs. Um, I wanted to ask you um, a question in that regard. New Zealand has already gone through an evolution of inter-ethnic relations. Your country has come really a long way in accepting ethnic diversity and cultural difference. The signing of the Treaty of Waitangi, is that how it's pronounced? Waitangi, yes. Waitangi. Um, in 1840, uh, secured equality and respect between the Maori and the non-indigenous population. And as we know, uh, treaties can remain well-intended agreements that lack clear steps for success and they're basically a piece of paper that people have signed and agreed to do something, but it's never done really. Um, what are some action steps that have been taken in New Zealand to move from a treaty only paper version to reality and really embrace biculturalism as it exists in New Zealand today? Mm. Yeah, it's a a very, a very broad and, and very good uh, question. And yes, of course, the, the Treaty of Waitangi is a significant document for our, our country, and it really symbolises the, uh, you know, biculturalism that is very important to, to uh, the history of our of our country. And it was signed um, in 1840 between the Crown and uh, 540 Māori rangatira or chiefs, uh, and uh, the document itself has not been without its its issues, as you allude to. Um, some of these stemming uh, to you know and, and some injustices and, and breaches of the treaty. Um, there's also um, an acknowledgement of some of the differences between the English and Māori translations of the agreement itself. So um, references in in the English version to um, sovereignty and to you know the nature of property and possessions in English. Um, uh, the translation uh, kawanatanga in Māori for sovereignty having kind of different connotations to perhaps the English translation sure. and likewise um, the use of the word um, tonga in the, in, the, in the Māori translation of the treaty um, compared to possessions in English. You know tonga is uh, are treasures in Māori which may be tangible or intangible so um, some of it stems from uh, differences in, in understanding from an uh, Indigenous perspective about things like relationship to the land, um, whereas uh, in the colonial uh, point of view was more of a transactional, you know, possession-based view of, of the land, land belongs to people versus a sense 
from from Māori Dham of actually people having more of a belonging to the land. So as a result of that and as a result of, you know, a number of kind of injustices and, and breaches as well, the, the treaty itself, um, uh, there has been a lot of injustice along the way. So just because the treaty's there doesn't necessarily mean that it was always honoured. Um, and a Waitangi tribunal was set up in 1975 as a, as a bit of a commission of inquiry to investigate some alleged breaches of the treaty by the Crown. Uh, because a lot of the breaches were actually kind of endorsed and, and done intentionally. Um, and, and more than 2,000 claims were lodged and, and a number of settlements since that time, which has been a means of uh, uh, kind of recognising the injustice and, and uh, you know, resettling with uh, giving back from the Crown to the various Māori tribes, um, land, uh, resources, uh, financial compensation. So there is an that has been a major part of it is that is the various settlements that have happened to acknowledge uh, those uh, kind of past breaches and injustices. But that's one element of it. Of course, the other is, is cultural uh, and, and language and, and various other elements. Um, uh, other time, you know, the language itself is, is Tonga. Um, it, it is a treasure and the language has been, has declined over many years, and a lot of that that was a, a because of colonialism. It was because of a kind of a, an oppression of of that indigenous language and culture, and so there, there has been a concerted effort, especially since the 1980s, with some major initiatives to to try to revitalise and, and revive the language, um, uh, in, in partnership with Māori, but also to mainstream. Um, so the Māori language now is something which is taught in uh, uh, many many schools. There are many um, full immersion Māori language schools, but even in, you'll find in, in mainstream schools and daycare and, and other places, there is not only just a Māori language option for, for, for children to take, um, but equally it's become part of everyday vernacular. You, at the beginning of this podcast, I think I greeted you with kia ora, which is a, a common New Zealand greeting now these days. And you've always done that. You've always, always done uh, that. This is my, you know, usually like, answer the phone, this is this is what I say, and that is a, um, in te reo Māori, the Māori language, meaning to wish someone be well, kia ora, or to be, you know, uh, healthy, wellness, um, a, a particularly um, relevant greeting in, in the times we're in right now. Right. Um, so, you know, while I think, you know, New Zealand does have uh, some, you know, good news and, and stories and um, experiences to share with the world around um, Indigenous uh, partnership, about the, the Treaty of Waitangi, about the work um, and partnership with, with Iwi and Māori, um, that doesn't mean we're not... Um, you know, uh, immune to, to other uh, things around the world. So <clears throat> the Black Lives Movement is um, grounded in uh, the idea that there is still systemic racism and injustice in, uh, in the system, in, in America, but this is worldwide. Um, and, and we can see this because the protests have resonated worldwide. Um, and that's also the case in New Zealand. And I think that the... The, move, the Black Lives Matter movement has been um, a, a good opportunity, I think, for, for all of us to reflect on the ways in which in our, in our personal conduct, in our professional lives, in, in the way we've grown up, um, identifying um, you know, the bias, unconscious biases that we all carry, um, the privileges that, that we all have in different ways, um, and uh, conversely, those who've grown up without that privilege and how it's impacted on the way that our societies are made up, um, how our systems are run, where the power balances sit, I think, um, you know, this is, it is a much broader um, uh, moment. And of course, this has been at the same time as, as the pandemic, but, you know, th there is no time like the present to address an issue uh, like this. Right. And it's, it, it's ongoing. This isn't a new thing. It's just, th these things reach tipping, and boiling points and 
uh, certainly it has created a lot of conversation in New Zealand around the ongoing influence uh, uh, and, um, and impact of colonialism uh, structurally. Um, uh, but of course, these are conversations that have been happening for a long time and, and our, our council um, just uh, the other year signed a um, partnership with a partnership agreement with the, the um, uh, Rangitani or Manawa Tu, the local uh, iwi, to work in close to partnership. Um, you know, iwi aren't just a state, one of many stakeholders. You know, the, the Treaty of Waitangi means that we have a partnership and we need to work in partnership around co-management right. of really important sites and lands around uh, particularly the environment and our waterways uh, because they have special meaning um, to Māori, particularly the iwi that, uh, uh, you know, are the mana whenua of this, of this uh, area and of this land. So, you know, I think, um, yeah, that's certainly something that we've uh, been working on. And, and as of this year, there are a number of our city councils that have been set up with members of uh, representing the iwi on those committees so that there is an active voice around the table um, on issues that are important to Māori and to the local iwi. So day by day, we, we try to make a, um, uh, improvements right. and uh, uh, within uh, our personal actions, within our institutional policies and frameworks and structures, and uh, we hope day by day to, to get to a better place of, of equality and, and justice. And there too, again, it shows how similar we are as sister cities because you are halfway around the globe and yet those issues are just as much on the forefront in your society as they are here. But similarly, we can also learn from each other. Again, as we said before, on the economy, on education, but also I think in race relations and in social justice. And like you said, the fact that this isn't um, isolated in the United States, but that this issue is a worldwide issue. It's a, it's a pandemic of a different kind in a way. Um, it's interesting to then again have a sister city uh, to hear how how uh, our partners are dealing um, with this topic and are trying to uh, find the best ways for you know the society as a whole in diversity and inclusion and equity uh, and, uh, and and I think that's again um, a great advantage for a city or a community to have an international twin to have an international connection um, to another city and mm -hmm. to be able to explore um, opportunities but also explore solutions together so and it, it has been um, uh, a real privilege to be able to learn and, and understand more about the um, you know indigenous uh, uh, particularly Salish Kootenai tribal group that is um, closest to uh, Missoula and is the Correct. Uh, I guess the mana whenua of the of the land you have there, and uh, I've really um, enjoyed having the opportunity to connect with a number of people. And uh, when we had our, our mayoral visit uh, in 2018, uh, I mentioned that uh, Wiramu and Tres Tiawiawi, the Rangitani, uh, the um, Komato of Rangitani Iwi, joined us, and also Professor. Associate Professor Honey Morris of Te Putahi Atoi, the School of Māori Knowledge from Massey University here joined. Uh, and that is really um, a signal of the, the importance and the strength of the connections that we can build uh, between our cities among um, indigenous populations, but the opportunity for us to all work together in, in partnership to, to learn more about um, each other and to find solutions uh, together 
and to to learn the best of of what we can from from all cultures and you know particularly in, in some of the work uh, I've been looking at with University of Montana and Massey University around getting kind of student teams together virtually to look at issues around environmental sustainability. There's been a particular interest in, in doing this through the lens of indigenous knowledge, uh, which is not, not kind of a new thing. You know, this goes back thousands of years of really um, uh, valuable um, knowledge around environmental sustainability, which um, has, I think, for a long time, not had a strong enough voice in the way that we think about our economies and our environment. Right. So uh, right. we're really trying to um, work that element in because it is a really valuable and tangible part of the partnership and the opportunity that, that our cities and, and regions have to work together. Sure. Well, Tony, in tying our podcast back to where we started today, um, what is the most enjoyable aspect of managing the international relations for the city of Palmerston North in New Zealand? Uh, I think yeah, the most enjoyable thing is just the, the breadth of um, people, different people I get to work with. Uh, before this, I, I worked in a central government job where a lot of my um, travels and work was just kind of meeting and talking with other government bureaucrats. And, you know, as, as much as, you know, I love that work and I can, been one so you know everybody's an interesting person what I really love about working at a city level is one day you're working with people in business and one day you're working with um, youth and and students and another day you're working with um, you know uh, you're working with iwi partners and and looking at indigenous cooperation and another day then you're you're working um, on city to city official cooperation and it's that variety of people's backgrounds, people's experiences, um, all coming together um, and, and the tangible connections that are made. These aren't kind of, uh, you know, you, you see the people doing exchanges, you hear from the young people who say that, you know, the opportunity to go there and do this thing has changed their life. And that to me is incredibly valuable and satisfying. Well, I would agree. Um, uh, I have sort of the uh, I'm the counterpart to to your office over here, and I would I would agree it's the it's the breadth of 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 the job that makes it uh, mm. so enjoyable and amazing, and uh, and certainly I think the impact that that one has, and and on that um, I uh, our daughter told me earlier that she's looking forward to um, a virtual meeting with your daughter, so yes. it go it goes to the next generation even it's not just us but it's um, it's our kids that are benefiting from this too, and are, are now having a connection and are uh, telling you know stories and experiences and sharing uh, sharing school life, uh, whatever it may be, or now summer activities, whatever those are in a in a pandemic uh, time. But um, that's sort of I think a really uh, a really nice aspect of this is that you can see already the next generation uh, being impacted. Absolutely. Tony, thank you so much. I, I so appreciate your time. Um, and uh, it's wonderful to know that you are there, even though you are halfway around the world, as we said, 12,000 kilometers away. But um, it's always nice to uh, reconnect with you and um, brings back very fond memories of, uh, of real life interaction. And um, I hope that uh, you and your family continue to be well uh, in these uncertain times and look forward to uh, connecting with you in the near future. Likewise, Udo. And uh, I look forward to our next Zoom, which will hopefully not be too far away and, and the great things we can work on together between us. Today. We will make it happen, Tony. Thank All you right. so much. Thank Take you, care. Udo. Take, Take care. care. Bye. Bye-bye. I have been talking to Tony Grace, International Relations Manager at Missoula's sister city, Palmerston North in New Zealand. Thank you for listening, or as we say in German, Danke schön fürs Zuhören. If you liked this podcast, if your interests are in the area of global and intercultural education, programming, and international affairs, you connected to the right podcast. 
International Voices is brought to you by Global and Cultural Affairs of Arts Missoula and The Trail 1033. This and previous International Voices podcasts can be found at artsmissoula.org and The Trail 1033.com. Please join us again for the August edition of International Voices with special guest Daniel Boknar, former teacher and current policymaker and head of Division of Special Education in Germany's Ministry of Education in the state of Hesse and member of the management board of the European Agency for Special Needs and Inclusive Education.